I think it's a great idea that we just take one youth kids per two adults, you know, <laughs> and maybe God will do some amazing things in our, in our kids. They cannot go anywhere. They cannot, you know, hang around with their friends, you know. And la 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 And literally in that one hour, we had rain, we had sunshine, we had like a fog-like things, you know, and I was in the middle of my preaching and yeah, it actually rained, you know, so my paper got wet and my Bible got wet, but it didn't stay that long, but it was really, really pretty cool and nobody stood up and left because, you know, pastor's preaching and you cannot leave, right? So, and, you know, just a whole concept of this suffering and persevering. I think it just rings true in our experiences and also in the Bible, what we read. Um, so today I'm going to share with you verse 17 and 18 from the book of Romans, chapter 8. And if you can follow along, you can read it with me. Let's read it together. Ready? Go. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in this suffering, First of all, I want to share with you, you know, the word if here. It's not a if of doubt. It's an if of assuming, that assuming this is true. Like the way Satan tempted Jesus, if you are son of God. It's not a questioning or doubting or sin, you know, you are, we're not sure if you are son of God or not. So turn this stone into bread. But it's more of assuming that It is a fact, you know. And so if you read that, since we are children, then we are heirs, heir of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in this suffering, since we suffer in order that we may also share in his glory, right? I consider that I, our present suffering are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. So I want to share with you three truths that are very certain and this Paul is addressing here, right? And the first thing is the future salvation is certain. The suffering is certain. And the persevering is certain as well. Um, and I think what Paul is, is doing is that he's encouraging us, he's encouraging the believers that as all these things are happening, especially sufferings, that we do not give up in this running, this race that God has marked out for us, but continue, right? Continue to endure and not give up and keep going. Because our lives here is very short and our eternal glory and eternal reward is for eternity, is for very long. And sometimes when we read stuff like this, we try to read too much with our, with our left brain. Right, trying to process these things, like what Kevin was trying to say. And one of the things that I do when I do marriage counseling is that was they share with one another, and I tell them, don't listen to the words. Listen to their heart. And I think we need to do the same when we hear the Bible, when we read the Bible. Don't just listen to the words. And yes, words are important, right? but we need to listen to the heart. What is God trying to communicate to us through this writing of Paul? Right? So hear God's heart in encouraging us and helping us and moving us along in this path for us to experience of His glory. And this text points us to the future right away. This text points us to the future. The future salvation is very certain. As the Spirit of God confirms our adoption and as a child of God, the Spirit teaches us the certainty of the future salvation. The certainty of we will share in the glory of Jesus Christ. We all know that time has not come. right? It will come, but even how the present suffering, look at the words, present suffering is compared with the glory that we will 
be revealed is definitely future, right? Definitely future. So this section is an introduction of the, the, this whole next section, which ends in verse 30. And verse 30 ends, and those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. See, Paul writes this future event as a past sentence because he's so certain that these things will take place. And it's as good as those things already have taken place. So there's three aspects of salvation even. And I always talk about this. You know, our salvation experience is not something that it happened 15 years ago or two years ago or whenever you came to faith. That is just the one-third of your experience. You were saved. Yes, that's how you begin your relationship with God. But we continue to be saved. You know, Jesus tells us, the Bible says that work out your salvation with trembling and fear. Right? So it's not just something that you have begun and it is done with, but you continue to live in that loving relationship with God. And there is that definite future when God reestablishes a new earth and new heavens, right? right? When Jesus comes back and He will save us from the presence of all sin, that's when we will surely say that we are saved. When we begin, God saves us from the penalty of sin. And as we walk in his, in, in his relationship with God, right, He saves us from the power of sin. But in the future, when Jesus comes back, He will save us from the presence of sin. The yeah. Bible is very clear of this future salvation. What you see here right now, right, what you experience right here for 70, 80, 90 years is so temporal. And something, I don't know which university it is, and he says in that university, there's, there's a motto somewhere. It says, what is not eternal is not important. So what he tells us that something is very eternal is very important. The value. Why is gold worthy? Is it because of their chemical structure, right? You know, that chemical structure, it bonds with other things less. So it stays as gold, and the, yeah, as gold for a long time. That's why it's very pure, right? And so something that is eternal something that does not change, that gives you that kind of value. So even in Romans 8.23, it talks about not only so, but our, we ourselves, who have the first fruit of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. He's looking at the future. You know, there are even our bodies, not just spiritual rebirth, but our bodies even will be renewed by God. Right? Verse 5, or chapter 5, verse 9 says, Since we have now been justified by His blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through Him? Right? Looking at those of day, that presence of sin will be totally removed. Philippians 1 6 says, Being confident of this, that He who began a good work in you will carry it to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. What, what is he talking about? Day of Jesus Christ. He's talking about Jesus' return, the completion of the salvation history in removing sin from our presence. Did it already come? No. Right? No, it's not come yet. The Spirit of God helps us to wait patiently in prayer for this future salvation. And that's why as I go on, and verse 26 in chapter 8, it talks about in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. Sometimes our suffering in the ways that we live here is so great, the words don't come out. Just, or in Korean we say, Abuji. Or Jia, you know, or Lord, you know, that only those things come out. We don't know what to pray for. We're so weak. Even though God has given us all these signs of hope, we don't see that hope. That we cry out, Abba Father, in utter dependence of Him, because He's the one who began that good work in us. And He's the one who will carry us. Remember the, the poem, The Footprints? Right? This person was doubting that when he had a hard time, that God has left him. But that's why he only saw one set of footprints. 
But that God reminds him, no, that's when I carried you. That's why you only see one set of footprints when you are having the most difficult time. Our perspective, we look at it, we see how God has left us, but God reminds us, no, it is He who begins the good work in us. It is He who carries us on. So salvation belongs to Him. It is His work. A lot of times it's, it's, we think it's us who are doing it. No, it's God who began that good work. And He will carry it until the day of Jesus Christ. This few future is the full restoration of the glory that we had from the beginning and even more. You know, due to sin, we fall short of God's glory. That's what Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You know, I think because of what the glory that we had before, we strive to have this glory. You know, we, we strive, we all you know, want to do something or, or whatever it is, at least we, 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 we experience birth, we, we, we were born with that desire to restore this glory. But then we do it our own ways. You know, even in our Korean culture, we say when a tiger dies, it leaves, it, it leaves its skin. The tiger skin is expensive, huh? Yeah. But when people die, they leave their name. What is they saying? It's a fame is important. That's what they're saying, right? Right? You know, and so we, in, in our innate nature, that we want to be restored of that glory in our own way. Yeah, we want to be saved in our own ways. But God gave us a way. And that way is not through us, but that way is through Jesus. That's why Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth. Truth means the ultimate reality. And He is the life, the ultimate perfection. The salvation cannot stop any point short of that entire perfection. So our, we were saved, we are being saved, we will be saved, and the entire perfection, the Christ, is our goal in the connection, in the transformation, and in our destination as well. It's not Christ's likeness is the goal, Christ is the goal. And in our connection with Him, He's the one who changes us. He is the one who bears much fruit. And He Himself is the goal. The relationship with Him is the beginning, is the middle, is the end, and that is the everything. The future salvation is very, very certain in the Scripture. In our relationship with God, in the ways that Christ's Spirit leads us, that future salvation becomes very, very certain. And we must continue in our walk until the end. Until the end. And that's why we're all cheerleaders in some sense. We are encouraging each other not to give up. Encouraging each other to continue this walk. Continue to read the Bible because God is the one who's at work. You know, when we go even preach Christ to people, what do we want them to do? We want them to read the Bible because of Power is in his words, right? Right? It's sharper than any double-edged sword. And God's spirit who breathes these words in the same spirit works in their hearts to bring conviction, bring judgment, and bring righteousness in their lives so that as they continue in the word, that's why I love it. When you go to like, you know, mission trips, you do one hour quiet time. Why isn't that great? When you live in America, what do you do? Five minutes here, two minutes there? Right? We call that quiet time? Or now we have Bible, one minute Bible. I said, what the? You know, in some sense, yeah, I take whatever you give me. But my goodness, you're spending time. Imagine you are on a date, you spend one minute with that person, you're never going to get the second date. <laughs> I have one minute for you. What do you need to say to me? <laughs> Forget it, man. I can't. Yeah. I'm out. You know? I mean, God's so patient with us, and He takes whatever He, you know, we, we have, but we have to be led by the Spirit and, and know who this person is. And Spirit of God affirms that we belong to God and gives us confidence that we are His child and heir of Him. It doesn't matter what's going on in this world. Right? Oh, my friend. He, um, right now, the election se se uh, you know, season, right? There was a lot of, you know, uh, the voting things going on. And my, my friend, he says, like, yeah, you know, we don't follow donkeys. We don't follow elephants. We follow our Lord. 
who is a lion. Amen? Yeah, who do you follow? We follow the lion, our Lord. Right? Our confidence is in Him. It's not our confidence in America. I'm grateful for America, right? For what they were able to provide for me. But God is the only one that we follow. And we must trust in Him and be assured of this future salvation. And let the Spirit of God lead us uh, to point of that certainty of our salvation as it in here, but it ends in, in, in eternity. Yeah. And so we must continue on. So future salvation is certain. The second truth that we are certain is something that we Americans, you know, I'm, a, I'm an American, you know, we don't like. You know, we really do, not, do think our idol is comfort. We used to have nice pews here, but then people didn't want to pews anymore. And now, I mean, we did it some other reasons. We, we got chairs because, uh, you know, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven chairs, and we get crowded. We can put nine people there. That's why we got, uh, <laughs> we got these chairs, and, you know, and, and we got chairs because of a homeless shelter. Because we want to do the homeless shelter here, that's why we replace the pews with this, because pews you cannot take out, right? And I really do think, you know, our idol is comfort, you know? Yeah. We got so spoiled and living in North America that when we think about not having indoor plumbing, no air conditioning, no restaurant food, no comfort, no cell phone, no entertainment, we might freak out. You know, in the olden days, the crisis was when they didn't have any food, when they didn't have any shelter. You know, but now our crisis is when our cell phone dies. No battery. Oh, it's the end of the world. Do they have Wi-Fi? You know, <laughs> anywhere you go, people ask, you know, do you have Wi-Fi? You know, like, oh, what's that? <laughs> right? Yeah. And I think it's so good, important for all of us to understand, be certain of this, this, this discomfort, this suffering. The suffering must be certain. You know, and, and, but look at the words, right? It says, we share in His suffering. If, since we share in His suffering, in order that we may also share in His glory. It's His suffering. It's not our own suffering. Sometimes we suffer because of our own mistakes, you know, or mistakes of other people, right? And those are other sufferings from the fallen world. This world is really messed up. Sometimes you go some places and some other people are there and they may have arterial motives and you, you know, may get the end of what they are planning to do. They're shooting everywhere. People do bad things to other people. Even in our natural orders are messed up. You know, there are diseases and sicknesses right, that our loved ones experience and even we ourselves experience. Uh, right? And so they all bring suffering to us on top of this ordinary suffering as a follower of Jesus Christ, we share in His suffering. That's something extra that we experience just because we are suffering. It doesn't mean that we are suffering because of Him. We have to understand, okay, where is this suffering coming from? Am I suffering because of Christ? Because I'm following Him? Because of doing things that He is asking me to do? Or am I suffering because of this natural, you know, fallen world uh, order, right? So what kind of suffering is this? You know, Jesus told us about this. Even his beatitudes at the end of it, Matthew 5, 11 says, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Right? Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So Jesus is reminding us in the Sermon on the Mount that the suffering will come when you follow me. And how when the suffering comes, we ought to consider and rejoice and be glad because we are walking in the same path as Jesus Christ. Now, do, do you see in yourself like, like the water of currents coming in, like the world is going, going in one direction, and you're going against that, right? You're going upstream. And how difficult that is. And make sure you have to make sure your each foot, right, step is in, in firmly planted so you can take the next step and like you're going, the water is flowing against you. Imagine if that's all people, 
right, hitting against you, and you're right, going against people and going upstream, and there's Christ, and this, all the people in this world is just following the worldly pleasures and worldly goals, and, but then your goal is Christ, you're going against them, right? Wouldn't you, wouldn't you be suffer? Because people will be hitting you. Right? Or not just, you know, like it's just kind of going by and hitting you, but then they're going against you and they don't want to let you go first. Oh, excuse me. Oh, go ahead first. They're not going to do that. They're just going to go. They're going to just run over you. Right? But then, but you know, you don't want to go where the world is going, but you want to go where Christ is leading you. And even statistics, right? Only 9% of people in America are Christians. And imagine 90 people are going one way and 10 people are going the other way. Right? We will experience suffering. The world is against God, and the way of the world is not the way of God. The goal is different. The principles are different. The values are different. That is why we clash. That's why we clash. Humans are fallen. And without being born again, we will be enemy, ungodly, helpless, and sinner. In our new nature, in the ways the Holy Spirit transforms us, in our new nature, we can understand God's will. God gives us empowerment to obey His will. right? And God gives us the desire and the power to do what God desires us to do. And But without that, regardless how nice person you are, you are going against what God says. You ought to go. Yeah. So from the world, we face persecution. We face mockery, scorn, and ridicule. That you sitting, you sit somewhere in the corner and you preach Christ, what, what, what people will say to you? Even Christians will tell you, say to you, hey, this never works, don't do it. Yeah? I mean, don't ever say that to people who preach Christ in the corner street somewhere in New York or in LA. At least you can do, go buy a bottle of water that might be thirsty, you know? And God bless you. And if you don't like that, then just walk away. But at least, you know, ask, tell them, God bless you, you know. And, but because you don't know how God may work. And some, most people say, this doesn't work, this doesn't work. I know for a fact one person, right? She was going to commit suicide. And she ran into this person who was a street preacher. And because of that, she decided not to do, not to go through with it. That one person is worth Every other street preacher in this world. And who knows what other people are going through and they may hear the name of Jesus or name of God or the conviction from the Lord and change their, change their life. Right? So don't be, in just like, you know, don't be so judgmental in those kind of things. Right? They are fallen under the conviction of God and that's why they are doing what they're doing. And if they preach the wrong gospel, then maybe you can tell them, but just because they're doing the things that you may not agree with, right? And thus they get persecuted, mocked, right? Scorned and ridiculed. And that's why Jesus tells again and again, even in Luke 21, 16, you will be betrayed even by parents, brothers, relatives, and friends. And they will put some, uh, some of you to death. All men will hate you because of me. All men will hate you because of me. Because those people who are not regenerated, they don't have a relationship with God, right? They are against what the Word of God is saying. They are against God. That's why the age of this world, right? Age of God of this world is blinding us so that we may not see the glory of Christ. So we will continue to be blinded of seeing how glorious of Jesus Christ is and when people preach Christ and people love Jesus and people want to follow Jesus, right, we don't like that. People don't like that. You know? Sometimes when you try, try to stand up for what is right, well, people might mock you and say, who do you think you are? A saint? And so then we get like really small, right? right? You know, peer pressure. High school, college, right? You might want to stand up and do something, you know, noble or something that God is telling us to do, Right? And they may mock you. Right? Who do you think you are? A saint? And I say, yeah. Yeah. You have to learn some offense. I think too many Christians are just playing all defense. And I tell you, doesn't matter how good defense is, you'll never win. You got to put some score 
right? Score some points and in order for you to win. Because, yeah, the Bible says that we are saints in Jesus Christ. Not because of us, because of what Christ has done. Because of His righteousness. Because of what God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die for me, for me to have relationship with God. And God has continued to change me. I'm not saying I'm perfect, but He's changing me to be like Jesus Christ. In that, I'm a saint. We've got to learn how to play offense. Nicely, of course. <laughs> Gently, with respect. The world, you know what the world is trying to do? The world is trying to silence us. They want to privatize our relationship with God. They say, whoa, oh, you can believe whatever you want. Just don't do it in the public setting. You know, that's not new. That's what they try to do with Daniel. Daniel, you can do whatever you want in your private setting. But when you're in public, you know, three times a day, or whatever the setting was, right? You got to pray to this guy and that and whatever that he needs to do, right? And this world, the same thing, back then, like a Daniel time, is trying to privatize the matter in between my relationship with God, right? And that's why God knew that. And so from the beginning, Jesus tells us, right? He tells us, if you're ashamed of me, I will be ashamed of you. You know? And so in, 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 in our relationship with God, God works in our heart so powerfully. And listen to me, don't get me wrong, because sometimes you may think as, oh, you know, it so, sounds so legalistic. It's not legalistic at all. In our relationship with God, God becomes so glorious, so beautiful, and so amazing, and so wonderful, that you don't want anything else to come out of your life. I, at least that makes sense up here, but we are walking in that truth and for more of that Christ will come out of my life. And that's why it's a supernatural relationship with God where God lives in us and brings out the reality of the truth, the life, the perfection out of our life. And as we are in that process, we are being saved and we will be saved. See, martyrdom is real in all over the world. You may not hear about that. You may hear here and there, you know, people stand up, standing up for some rise of, you know, not serving in some way and stuff like that in America too, right? right? But then in all over the world, it's very real. And even in the first century, their motto was, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Yeah. Because they love Jesus so much, they didn't mind bleeding. They didn't mind dying for the name of Jesus Christ. So even this guy, Origen, you know, when they were persecuting the Christians, he wanted to go and die because the, in the streets that they were looking for people to, you know, to kill and stuff like that. But then his mom was kind of smart and so he... Uh, smart or I don't know, but she hid his clothes so that she couldn't go outside. He couldn't go outside. So I guess he didn't want to be modern naked. <laughs> so that was, uh, so then he became a great theologian and, and things like that. Right? But that was their mindset. The blood of the martyr is a seed of the church. They embrace the truth of God where Christ told them. And how did Christ die? He was crucified. Most Painful and shame. It's a death of suffocation, right? You know, like when you're some, somebody suffocates you, may, maybe like two minutes you die, right? Or, and, but this one was maybe like hours and they go die. So then after suff suffocating and then when they don't die, so that people had to come and they would break their legs so that it would be all drained of their blood so that they would die that way since they're not dying that fast through suffocation hanging on the cross. But in Jesus, right, he was already dead. So what did they do? They speared them, and all the water and blood kind of came out and make sure that, and that was prophesied right long, long time ago in, in Psalm 22. And so Jesus died in a very painful own way. And he was died, he, 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 and before he died, he suffered, right? And, and these Jews and these Romans didn't like what Jesus was trying to do and what Jesus said. Yeah. So Paul experienced it too. 
2 Corinthians 4, 7 says, But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. That power to endure, like what Kelly was saying. You know, it was God working in me and giving me the strength to do all these things. You know, right? right? And we are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that His life may be revealed in our mortal body. So this death and resurrection, death and resurrection, there's no resurrection without death. There's no resurrection faith without experiencing death. You know, Paul was not some sick person who liked pain and suffering, right? He supremely loved Jesus. And proclaiming Jesus and persecuting Cain because he was proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. When somebody does that with this lifestyle of Jesus Christ, we don't like him. We want to get rid of him. Why? Because we want to be all equal. We want to be all equal. And that's what this world is trying to do. Silence the Christ. Silence the Christian and say, hey, don't say you are the best. You're just any other like religion. No, we must continue John, preach John 14, 6. He, he is the only truth. He is the only way. And he is the only life and no one else. And that's what the Bible says. Right? And so when you put that in the same litmus test for that, when somebody says everything's equal, say, hey, is that absolutely true? Why is that absolutely true and not Christianity is the absolute true? Right? It's kind of weird, right? Everything ought to be in its own value. So if that person is saying, though, only I say things that are absolutely true and everything is kind of equal, no, that's not true either. Everything has to be under the same scrutiny. Right? Yeah. And other apostles, like, you know, apostles died with. Tradition tells us that all except the apostle John died of martyr. Yeah. And the result of suffering is what? 1 Peter 5.10 says this, And the God of all grace who called you to His eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, everybody say a little while, a little while, will Himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. And some other verse, uh, ver- a version says perfection. Yeah, a little while. Are 60, 70, 80, 90, or 100, 10 years. It's just a little while compared to eternity, right? Eternity is eternity. It's forever and ever and compared to that. We only have seven. You know, when they go to Mexico, yeah, I can endure anything in two, two weeks. Hey, like a month because I'm going home, you know, right? I'm going to America, you know? I have AC in my car, and I can go in here, I drink my boba, you know, whatever I want. You know, when you're in Mexico, oh, yeah, you gotta watch out. You know, there's a lot of federal rallies, you know, like people with guns, and like, you know, you don't hear gunshots, but then, yeah, it's a little bit scary, you know? The turning lane is kind of weird, you know? Like, yeah, so I was talking, talking about Kevin, like, oh, he's the only high, school, high schooler going, and like, I, I was thinking, oh, this is, I'm not going. I don't know how their parents were going to do it. But then, yeah, their parents are school, you know? Or maybe they have some plans for to get rid of their kids or something, you know? But, <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, it's amazing, you know? Yeah, so it's a little while. We can endure a little while. A little discomfort in 60, 70 years is a little while compared to eternity, right? We can endure Africa, you know, or, or Pakistan, or any place in the world, and still they have air. They have water, they have bottled water everywhere you go. I've been to a lot of places, and they actually have bottled water. So praise the Lord, <laughs> you, know, you know, they want to sell it, you know. Yeah, so it's a little while, and our world here is a little while. And He will restore us, make you strong, firm, and perfect. Make you perfect, make you like Jesus Christ, to share in His glory. And that's the purpose clause. And all this suffering is not just for suffering's sake. So that through suffering, the perfection will come. You know, when you think about when you really experience life transformation, is it when things go really well, you know? Usually when things go bad, right? Right? When things go bad, you you pray more. 
When things go right, like, mm, oh, I forgot to pray, you know, right? But man, nobody has to tell you pray when things are going bad. Right? Right? And because you need God. And so in maturity, what happened? We know we always are in need of God. The Abba Father, in utter dependence of Him, the Spirit reminds me, even things are going fine, right? You need God. When things are not going fine, that's why you need God. That is the way of God. Cross and resurrection, suffer and grow. We bring more glory to God as we continue to experience suffering and in the ways that God continues to make us more like Him. Don't run away from persecution and compromise the gospel. You know, when I was growing, and even spiritually, when there's two decisions to make, and in some sense, I always choose something that is more difficult. You know? And when I talk to my son, I say, hey, son, what do you want to do? He always picks something easier. <laughs> you know? And I say, oh, Lord, how are we going to teach our next generation? You know, I really believe the persecution is coming to America. More persecution is coming to America. And how do we raise our child to be able to endure the martyrdom, for them to stand up to the faith of Jesus Christ? The days are coming when the world will continue to pressure us to be silent, continue to pressure us to be a non-Christian, make every religion equal importance. You know, we don't take our cues from the world, but we take our cues from the Bible. And the definition of the Christian is from Matthew 4, 19, for me anyway. Right? Follow me. I will make you fisher of men. Who are Christians? Not people who go to church. Who are Christians? Are people who follow Christ. Who people who hear from the Lord. My sheep hears my voice. And I know them and they follow me. It's not important for us to know Christ. The Bible says that we hear His voice and God knows us because we hear His voice and we follow Him. We experience life transformation because we follow Him. In the context of relationship, He makes us. He says, I will make you in the ways that we abide in Him, in the ways that we connect with Him, in the ways that we make Him our goal. He makes us. I will make you a fisher of men, he says. His mission becomes our mission. That is the definition, and I want our kids to live in that. I want us to live in that together. God is really brewing that heart of me again and again, again to go preach Christ on the campuses. You know, I'm so really praying through that. And so how we can continue to, you know, even invite suffering. Right? Even, even embrace suffering. We know we're going to suffer, but still going there because He's worthy. His name is worthy for us to lift His name up. And through that, we may grow and be perfected and bring more glory unto the Lord. Third one is kind of short, right? You know, persevering is certain. We must persevere. Remember in wedding ring? When you get married, there's three rings. Wedding ring, Suffering and persevering, right? There's, there's three rings. And marriage is hard. It is. It's dying experience. You think you're going to walk on cloud nine all the days of your life? Wake up. It's not like that at all. The reality says like, oh, I got to love this woman. Uh, I got to love these little things running around, like making my life crazy and, you know, all mixed up. And, right, that's why... Right, people who have kids don't have kids, right? They look much better without kids, right? Because they don't have to suffer that much, you know? That's why we don't say, uh, fold your dishes, you know? And so, you know, uh, because your mind going crazy, right? You got all these things going on, you know? Yeah, and Paul is something, sharing something very certain here. He's certain that, right, even though he says, I consider it means that he's certain. He's certain that this present suffering is no comparison to the future glory that he gets to share in Christ. So if I ask you that you're walking down the street and there's a thousand dollar bill and a penny, you have to pick up one, right? Which one would you pick up? Of course, thousand dollar bill. People, you say penny, you know, you need to talk to your dad. <laughs> and I know, I talk to my dad. Thousand dollar bill is real. The bank transfers like that, and they have thousand dollar bills. And you know, some people say, like, "Oh, pastor, you know, you lied." No, there is thousand dollar bill. Yeah, which one would you pick up? And that's what Paul is saying. The value of suffering, the value of you know the future glory that he will experience in Christ is no comparison. You no, know, can you imagine what kind of glory Jesus will receive? 
What kind of glory the God, the Son, the second person in Trinity will receive? You know, sometimes I think I'll be a little bit embarrassed, a little sheepish, you know? You know, like, oh, God gives you a reward. Like, oh, yeah, I don't deserve really this because it was all you. But, you know, when I think about it, we'll be so overwhelmed by who Jesus is, we won't even have time to be embarrassed. We'll be so mesmerized of this, whatever is going on in His glory, we won't have any time or anything to think about us. I experienced that twice in my life. You know, and you lose yourself. Literally, everything in this world becomes dim and in non-existence. Only Christ and in His glory. Can you imagine that? Under Christ, Bible says, all things in heaven and earth will come together. They will be unified under Christ. Every tongue will confess and every knee will bow. And same glory that was with the Father, God the Father, Jesus will share in that. When you look at the Revelation, it kind of talks about it. What kind of glory? Can you imagine that kind of glory? Then we get to share in that glory. 2 Corinthians again, he says, Therefore, do not lose heart. What is he saying? That because we lose heart in our sufferings. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day for our light and momentary troubles. Right? Our light and momentary troubles. Uh, this day shall pass also. That's one of my favorite sayings. I know you have a hard day sometimes. This day shall pass. Right? And the new day will come. Right? And for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. What is your eye fixed on? The things that you see in this world or things that is not, not seen? God, Christ, you know, our hope, the, 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 the glory. Fix your eyes on, the, on our living hope. You know, non-Christians suffer too because sins of this world. But they don't have eternal hope. They don't have anything that comes out of it. Right? Christians have Jesus who live under the living hope. That's what Romans says, not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that sufferings produce perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, and hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out His love into our, heart, our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit pours out God's love upon our eyes so that we know through suffering is not the end. There is a character, there is a hope, and there is that hope that does not disappoint us. Then after that, what happened? Another suffering. Praise the Lord. And after that, you come out victorious and character and hope. What happens there? Another storm. Yes. Bring it on for the glory of God. That's thousand dollar bill right there. Everything gets to point to, to Jesus, point to God. It was God who began it. In the ways that I was able to endure, it was God. He gave me the strength. It was His love that compelled me, that endured me. It was His word. God changing me. God sharing me with His glory. God is the one who called me. And more and more we realize how big God is and how little we are that we get to share. God allowed us to share in that. Oh my goodness. When you are able to live in the certainty of that our future is, the future of our salvation is certain, and our, our suffering is certain, our perseverance is certain in Christ, not that you try, we abide in Christ, and He will make certain of our future salvation. He will em make us embrace the suffering. It's not like we want to suffer, right? Oh, those kids, I want them to suffer when they go to mission trip. Yes! No, I don't want our kids to suffer, but for Christ's sake, for Christ's sake in me, how we must experience the suffering and endure and persevere and come out victoriously. And those three things that the scripture is reminding us to be certain of, future salvation, suffering, and perseverance, I believe that God will receive many, many, many glory from that. So embrace it. Let the Holy Spirit 
abide in us and lead us to certainty of the future. This is not everything. It's okay who we are. Our name is not important, but name of Jesus is important. We live for eternity. Do not right, store up treasure in on earth. Treasure, store treasure in heaven. You know, our life here is in preparation for heaven. And so we can endure this light and sure suffering. So we can sign up to go to mission trips. Even to Pakistan and to Middle East. Or however God is leading us. And through the Holy Spirit leading, He will make certain of our perseverance is real. And it's very satisfying and fulfilling in Christ. I want to give you time to reflect and really pray through all the things that we've been thinking wrong about Christianity. Kind of thought about, oh, it's about comfort, which is our idol. And in the ways that Paul communicates to us, the Spirit of God lives in our hearts that testifies to us that we are God's son, God's child, and heir of God and the co-heir of Christ. And this salvation is future, is, in, is, 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 is certain. And for the name of Christ, for the following of Christ, yes, there is that suffering. That we don't want to just to avoid those sufferings and avoid growth as well. In the ways that how God has been communicating to us, if you've been avoiding the suffering, we pray that glory of Christ will richly overwhelm you. And for you to embrace suffering, to go through suffering and be victorious in order for you to be perfected and experience more of God's glory. God, we do that in our prayers. Father, we thank you for your word. And thank you so much for testimonies of Gabby and Kelly and Kevin. And may your words, the, your powerful word, continue to convict our hearts for you to become our goal, our destiny. May you be what we our eyes fix upon from now till you come back, Lord. May we not be distracted by the things of this world, which is temporal. May we have these spiritual eyes to see and fix our eyes on you for all the days of our lives. We thank you. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you all. Have a great Sunday.